Hey guys, we are live. Welcome to the Whitwom Organics Weekly Garden Report. My name is David Whitwom, and I am your host. I'm getting started a little late today and a day later than usual. So we are going to uh, talk about a few garden myths um, that I come across quite often. And we are also going to either dispel them or talk about uh, kind of when they work and when they don't. It's really important uh, to understand why something works so that you know that, um, that uh, you're using it properly and why um, things just aren't a magic bullet. But first, let's get into our nursery report. Um, so I have a feeling that this is going to be a hot mess, but I'm going to try something today. I'm going to try and take you guys with me out into the nursery. Um, so we'll, we'll actually do the garden report from there. So let's see. I do not have my uh, my gimbal hooked up, so I do apologize. It's probably going to be pretty shaky, but we're going to give it a go. All right. See if I can't make you guys sick. We <laughs> all right, so we're gonna actually go do this out in the nursery today. Now I got to figure out how to um flip the camera around. See if I can't do that. For those of y'all just tuning in, we are actually doing our garden report live. I'm actually carrying you guys out into the nursery Oops, so we can see what we have uh, what we have growing. That's not the right button. All right, settings, camera. There you are. It worked. So somebody who's tuning in. Hi, Jessica. So somebody who's tuning in, if you could guys just let me know if you can still hear me. I had to kind of leave and come back. You can type it in the comments. I'd appreciate it. Um, so here we are in the nursery. Our pentas are looking really good. We have some parsley. We have been dealing with some... Um, some caterpillars out here in the nursery. And I believe last week I had mentioned uh, white flies on some of our uh, nightshade plants, on our peppers and on our tomatoes. But if anybody's tuning in wondering, is it too hot right now to plant? Okay, thank you guys um, for letting me know about the sound. If it's too hot to plant uh, certain things, as you can see, we just have a plastic cover out here. We do have a little bit of fan, but like we're out here in the open. I'm in Tampa, just like you guys, and we're planting. This is Swiss chard. We're not doing anything magical. Um, this is actually uh, some lettuce right here. This has not even been put in the fridge. Uh, eggplants, two different kinds of lettuce. This is our Manoa lettuce and our Jericho uh, romaine uh, cucumbers. Guys, we also have all these great blue curl plants here. Um, let's see if I can find one with a flower. The flowers get blown off really easy, but it always has tons of these little uh, buds uh, right behind it. Real beautiful native uh, wildflower does really well in Tampa. We have plenty in stock. Um, so here we have uh, some Mizuna mustard, uh, Mabuna, uh, green sprouting broccoli. Um, just some stuff that has, like, we just planted. Uh, beans are already doing great. Uh, back here we have uh, some thyme. The parsley just sprouted today. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, chives, lemon basil, oregano. I don't know if y'all have ever grown oregano, but the seeds are so tiny. Look at those little plants. Uh, some basil, sage, sweet basil, corn. So, I mean, it's definitely not too hot to get this stuff going. Here's some of our um, 
some more kale that we've already up planted. I believe this is, oh, there's a tag, red choy. That's a bok choy, very heat tolerant. Um, here's our cabbage, red acre cabbage, blue curly kale. Um, another round of uh, Everglades tomatoes, California Wonder peppers, brandywine tomatoes. This is kind of how we leave things in plug trays uh, until we pop them up into our sellable four packs. Um, arugula, astro arugula. This is young green, um, which is a yu choy sum. If you go to a traditional Chinese restaurant, that's usually what they call Chinese broccoli. Delicious if you've never had it before. It's a cut and come again plant. It's actually more related to like uh, a bok choy than it actually is to a broccoli, but it tastes wonderful. This is uh, another Florida native pepper verbena. Um, jalapeno peppers, I'm sorry, um, habanero peppers with habaneros on them, little, little October pumpkins. Um, oh, so we got some red kale. This is our Parasicaba broccoli from Brazil, super heat tolerant. Oh, this is our plug tray of what I already showed you guys, Chinese kale and arugula. Um, Portuguese collards or Portuguese kale, if you've never grown those before, I highly recommend it. It's absolutely delicious, uh, sweet, uh, kind of a collard green. I believe it's more related to kales, but the plant grows, looks just like collards. Two different kinds of Chinese uh, cabbage. Um, let's see what else we got. Oh, some more of our native flowers. <clears throat> Look at these guys. Do, 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 do. Partridge peas. We've got uh, tree basil. Um, this is not native, uh, and some varieties of lantana are actually highly invasive. Um, but this is a sterile variety. Uh, Tammy, all of our uh, stuff is online uh, at witwomorganics.com. We're actually an e-commerce nursery. Some uh, lemon basil. Uh, this is, I'm smelling it. This is African blue basil. These are Thai bird pepper plants in one gallon pots. And then we have a ton of these uh, large eggplant plants also in one gallon pots. So all of our cucumbers, uh, icebox watermelon, more cucumbers. So these are what the tomatoes look like when we first pot them up uh, from the plug trays. And this is what they look like when they're getting into the sellable four packs. So we just kind of wait for them to flush out um, these newer leaves and then we're for sale online. So these aren't for sale yet. We're waiting for them to change color and look more like these right here. So sun golds, some chives, and some more parasicaba and some mizuna. Uh, if you've never had Mizuna before, it's absolutely wonderful. Super easy to grow. Uh, um, so that's what we have in our nursery. Um, and again, I'm doing this if you're new to the channel. Um, you know, obviously to show you what we have growing in the nursery, but also if you're in Central Florida, it kind of gives you an idea of what you can be growing right now as well. So I'm here to dispel all the myths that it's too hot to get some of this stuff going. Um, and in fact, by the time this stuff would get uh, a little bit bigger and maybe show some stress from the heat, it will have definitely cooled off enough. Um, this Swiss chard is just looking amazing. So we'll probably be potting this stuff up uh, into four packs next week. Um, definitely one of the more heat tolerant greens. I'm not saying to go, you know, blow it wide open and plant everything um, right now, but you can definitely um, get away with some of the more heat tolerant greens. If you've, um, if you at least gardened through spring, the best way to think of it is which of your winter greens made it the furthest uh, into spring or summer.
Okay. So that's pretty much it. Um, how am I watering all of that, Scott? It's, I mean, I can show you guys my watering system. I'm just, the PVC pipe is actually just holding these pipe, these pipes up. And then I actually have these little uh, sprayers um, and it is on an automatic timer right there. And we actually have it set on three different zones, one for each table. And then the middle of the table is where the water comes up and goes to that side, goes to that side. So if we need to shut off the whole side of the table, we can. Whereas when we had it coming in on one side and going all the way down, you could only shut off like this half because if you shut it off down there, it shut off the whole thing. Um, thinking about even putting another uh, shut off right there and right there because just sometimes we're growing stuff that doesn't need as much water as other things. We got the same thing going on over here. Oh, I did put the, so this is what I'm talking about. I've got one halfway here. It tees up in the middle of the table and goes all the way down there and it goes all the way down there. So we have an on-off pointing that way, an on-off pointing that way. Then we have another one there and another one there. And there's actually, oh, look at the toothache plant growing down there. There's actually a solenoid down over here somewhere. Um, one inch table. So this is a three zone. I think this is actually a six zone timer. And we have three zones uh, so we can water the tables. Uh, independently and I haven't used it in quite I actually have a dosatron hooked up if I wanted to push any liquid fertilizers through the entire uh, system no Scott we do not filter our water and no Beth we do not have a well this is coming straight off of Tampa city of Tampa uh, of water um, I've been doing this here for 10 years and haven't had any problems so maybe that'll be um, uh, the myth number one that we dispel today. Um, I mean, I can't say whether or not things would look better out here if we were running off of rainwater or a well or if I filtered the water, but we really don't have any problems. And most of my gardens that I install are running straight off city water. We won't run off reclaimed water. Um, and I mean, I'm a huge proponent on encouraging soil biology um so i understand people's reservations and i really don't it's not something i talk about a lot because all of my evidence is personal and completely anecdotal um you know if someone wanted to run a well or uh filter their water or whatever i'm not going to stop them um but in my personal experience i have not seen a difference um Tammy, you're in Plant City, so we're not too far away from you. We do have a pickup option at checkout if you don't want to pay for shipping. Um, we have a pickup station out front um, where you can and, uh, pick up. Uh, you can choose the pickup. Then we schedule when you're going to come pick it up, and we put your stuff at the pickup station. Let me show you guys the graveyard. So we have um, – well, this is kind of the infirmary. So we have some uh, Thai basil plants here that we were struggling with, a little bit of powdery mildew and some peppers over here that we are struggling with, with some white fly. Um, here are some sweet basil plants that are getting ready to get cut way back and then potted up into one gallon pots. And then here is kind of everything from summer um, that we're slowly trashing. There's some pigeon pea plants and some uh, amaranth and some okra. Look how leggy that okra. Um, so this is kind of either our trash area. It might be stuff that I take and donate to certain gardens. Um, it might be um, so that we try and do experiments with or try and revive. Um, but this isn't stuff that is really on the website and for sale. It's just kind of stuff we're playing with. Let's call this, uh, it's not really the grave, but purgatory. They're not quite dead yet. Yes, Beth, you're right. Water is expensive. Um, I have about just uh, four. Well, for the nursery, I run 
the same water as we do for the house. And my monthly water bill is about a hundred dollars. Um, and we, we, I mean, we really do pare this thing down as much as possible and hand water to try and save water. Ooh, let me show you guys my, my, um, duct tape together, made up, uh, aquaponics. I've had this thing going for about four years. So I just took like a feeding trough here and then some garbage cans for uh, the, you know, to, to bleed off the solids. Like that pipe right there comes out of the bottom of this garbage can and that pipe goes into the top of this one. And then this one comes out of the side of this one. What I did here that was a little bit unique that I've never seen anybody do is I'm actually pumping out of here. So there's rocks in the bottom of there. And that kitty litter bucket in the rocks and in the kitty litter bucket is a pump. And I drilled holes only in the bottom of the kitty litter bucket. So basically all the water that gets into the kitty litter bucket has to make it through the rocks. And then the water's pumped up uh, to this uh, PVC pipe up there that's at a slight angle. And the water runs down and then comes back into the fish pond. And then the other thing I did that I've never seen anybody do um other than like in a regular fish tank that you have at home i'm like terrified right now sun's gonna come detached from this holder and fall in um i have a, a tube going down to the bottom right here with a t on it with just three quarter inch pvc pipe and a ton of holes quarter inch holes drilled throughout the entire thing in here I have, oh, I need to get a new stone. Look, my stone broke. But um, I guess it's working. It's just basically down in there uh, bubbling up. So that's forcing the water. It's like sucking the water up the pipe and into here. Because I was having trouble making sure that the water was getting out uh, fast enough for when it was coming in. Because this was overflowing. And so it's also adding extra air to the system before it comes into here and goes in through the rocks. And my fish are happy, and um, like I said, it's just been kind of doing its own thing for about three or four years now. All right, it's a little personal kefir lime tree. This is our African blue basil plant that we uh, take our cuttings off of. So that's it. That's what we got going on in the nursery. Now I'm going to try and figure out how to... Switch you guys back over to facing me, and then we will go inside and talk about a couple garden myths. All right. And there we are. Cool. All right, let's go back in here. Yeah, and I'm sorry, it's so shaky. I don't have a gimbal hooked up. Yes, Tammy, earth boxes are amazing. They work really well. I love their um, wicking action for the water. Right. So there's our nursery report as far as the garden report goes. Um. I'm just still, um, you know, probably doing what most of y'all are doing and trying to get these gardens uh, going and ready for fall. Um, you know, if you guys are new to this or you're from up north, um, new to this as far as, I mean, gardening or gardening in Florida, um, I, it's really important to remember that uh, our growing season is a little different in that you don't just go out there and plant your fall garden it's a process um you know you plant these things during during this time you plant some more in a couple weeks and then another couple weeks you plant more because if you just get out there and plant everything at once you're going to either have some stuff that's way too far behind for where it really should be or you might have planted some stuff that doesn't like how hot it still is so just remember when you're planting your um your crops that like this uh, warm weather that's cooler than 
deathly hot of July, make sure you're saving yourself some space for the stuff that you're going to want to plant when it really cools off at the end of October, November, um, and becomes tolerable. Excuse me just a second. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, you don't just get out there and plant far You can totally do that. I mean, I know people who wait until the end of October to really get out there and plant their fall garden. Um, but they're, they're usually that, I mean, on purpose, um, but they are usually, uh, you know, the, the stuff that should have been in a while ago, they're, they're getting plants that are this big where they started them indoors. Um, and then, you know, all the way down to the stuff that you should be just planting in November because it finally cooled off. Um, they're putting seeds in. So they might have some seed, let's just, you know, they might have seeds in of, of lettuces. Um, at, this is if you're planting at the beginning of November. So they might have seeds in of some lettuces and, um, you know, uh, squash plants and kale plants and collard plants that are this big. And then, and then tomato plants that were in like gallon pots. So this stuff is kind of, you know, that way that, and that's basically their garden on that day of November, the first week of November is going to look identical to someone else's garden who had been doing successive planting um, the entire time. So again, uh, let's see, what did I plant this week? Um, more peppers. So I'm getting all the peppers in, um, but I need to get in more corn seeds because that's coming to an end um, to be able to put your corn in. Um, the corn that we grow, by the way, for any of you who are spring corners only, um, corn growers, um, the corn that we grow is a very quick crop. It's called baby corn. The plants only get about five feet tall. Um, and each plant puts out ears of corn. They're about yay big, maybe is that like eight inches. Uh, super sweet, delicious corn, uh, but they, they're ready in about 60 to 70 days, super fast. Um, so we can always squeeze that fall crop. And, and even in the spring, I can squeeze uh, two rounds of, of corn in, in two different spots um, in, uh, in the springtime. But that's it for the garden report. Uh, make sure if you guys have any questions about uh, what you saw in the nursery, maybe what you're doing personally right now, um, then uh, make sure you post them now. And at the end, I'll kind of go through uh, the questions and see if I can't answer them. Um, Scott, I'd love to figure out a way to clean reclaimed water as well. They just throw a bunch of it out. I mean, it's like a, they have a pipe that just goes out into the bay because it doesn't all get used. Uh, but I, I mean, I'm pretty sure the, the there isn't that much of a difference between reclaimed water and drinking water except the final stages of, I think, like chemical uh, treatment um, to make it into drinking water, which is kind of gross, but um, I think Orlando uses reclaimed water in their drinking water. But, uh, but anyway, <laughs> that's a show for another day. Um, let's talk about garden myths. Um, if you guys have any that you've heard hey, Avon, uh, please post them in here because I have a few uh, top ones that I want to talk about. And I, you know, I, I'm sure throughout the next two weeks, I'm going to like bump into something and be like, oh man, I should have talked about that one or I should have talked about that one. But these are kind of the biggest ones, I guess, that I've run into just recently. Um, so if there's anything that you see people keep saying um, and you just basically, you know, you know it doesn't work. Um, then put it in the comments um, and we'll talk about it today, like right now. Um, but the first one, and also if you completely disagree with me, um, please put it in the comments. A lot of these garden myths are not garden myths all the time. Um, so you're going to always get pushback from people with anecdotal evidence that it works for them. The thing is, is sometimes we consider these to be garden myths because um, they don't always work. Like they're not a, a they're not a silver bullet for what people are trying to take care of and people think that they are. So that kind of makes them into, you guys know how on uh, Facebook right now they're flagging stuff with false and some of it's like contextually false or right, like completely false. 
that's how we kind of can gauge these garden myths. They're not always all completely false, um, but um, they also, maybe they work, but not for the reasons why people think that they work. Um, there's a good book out there. Um, I'll, I'll post the uh, information in the uh, after I'm done. So let's talk about the first one. Um, beer traps for slugs. So has anybody tried beer traps for slugs? And if you have, tell me what your experience is with that one. So this one is sort of a garden myth. In other words, it actually really does work. Um, the beer does attract slugs to your garden area. And they could, if the, the trap is set correctly, they could uh, fall into the beer and drown. So why is this a garden myth? It's a garden myth because take pictures during the solstice. Yeah, that's it. Oh, here they come, guys. <laughs> oh, man. I I might show comments. Can I do that? How do I do that? Settings. I'm trying to figure out if I can show all the comments uh, so everybody can see them. Uh, I don't think I can. I think I can do it one at a time. Okay, so we'll start with Scott's. And I'll just put them up and then probably switch to the next one. So here's Scott's. Take pictures during the solstice and equinoxes to know your garden sun exposure. <laughs> so the uh, the the slugs uh, in beer traps. The reason why it's a garden myth is because it actually works so well on attracting the slugs. You could actually be if your if your trap is not set up perfectly, where the slugs will actually fall into the beer. The beer actually works so well. You could actually be attracting more slugs into your garden. So they can actually uh, smell it, I guess, if that's the right word. Um, yes, I, I'm, if you, so Christine, the reason why this is considered a garden myth is because if it's not done correctly, just so just because you go out there and find dead slugs in the beer does not mean that you took care of the problem because the ones that were immediately surrounding the trap could theoretically have fallen into the beer, but there could have been slugs 20 feet away that begin smelling it and moving into your garden area. And by the time you're like, oh, it worked, and you remove the trap. Um, so at the same time, it attracts them to it, and they can get in and they and they die. Um, it actually brings other slugs in from further away into your garden area. So the beer actually works as it works really well as a, a trap, uh, an attractant. So that's the problem with the beer traps. It's kind of like the um, the mosquito traps. There's that mosquito trap that runs off of propane, I think, and it puts off carbon dioxide. And the idea of it is to uh, attract the mosquitoes in your yard um, it, and zap them in this, or catch them in a fan or however it works, trap them um, by putting off a plume of carbon dioxide. The problem is, is that plume of carbon dioxide actually starts bringing mosquitoes in from your neighbor's yard. So just because when you set a trap like that, it puts off some sort of a smell or pheromone or whatever to attract the things to the trap, just because you find dead things in the trap doesn't necessarily mean that it's working if it's bringing more of a population of that thing into your area. So I would think that the best way to do the beer trap would probably be to set it out for one night and then maybe wait a few days and set it out again, and then wait a few days and set it out again. And the other reason why we consider the beer traps to be a myth is because you really have to get the edges of it right. Because um, really, if, if you're not at least killing the ones that it's attracting, you're going to um, be causing more of a problem. And this has been done. Um, this is not... So, so everything that I'm bringing up right now actually has science to back it up. So this isn't just people's experience. This is actually university done studies to prove that they um, that they that this is what is happening and why these things are garden myths. Um, so the next one, 
I don't know if you get blowback on this one, I'm sure. Okay, so gravel in the bottom of your pots for drainage. Who's who's heard of that one? Who does it? I wish Annie was in here right now. I think she, you know, even tells people not to do this. So this one is actually kind of cool. I like I like the reason why this one's a myth. So the um the best way to look at why putting gravel in the bottom. Now I'm not saying you can put some again with these myths, it's important. This is what's cool about this. Once you understand why these are myths and how they're myths, then you can make them into not myths by understanding the science behind them. Okay. So if you take a sponge and uh, and get it soaking wet and then um, wring it out so it's, so it's still wet, right, and then set it down on the table, uh, or hold it above the table. See if water drips out of it. Okay. And then, and you want what, no water will drip out, or very little. Then take the sponge and turn it on its side, so it's so it's vertical. And what you'll find is that when it's vertical, when it's shaped vertically, um, water's going to begin dripping out of the bottom because of the capillary action of water and how it works. So when you have something that's shaped more like this, instead of like this, it actually drains better. So if you're taking a pot that's shaped like this, like this pot, okay? Again, this is gonna be exaggerated, but if you take this, this cup, which is shaped like a cylinder, so it's gonna drain very well. So water's gonna come through the capillary, pull the water down from the top to the bottom. And you fill it up with a bunch of rocks, Okay, again, this is exaggerated. You've just changed its shape. Okay, so it depends. It's, it's a ratio. I'm not sure exactly what the ratio is about width to height and whether or not the uh, capillary action is going to take place and actually pull that water out of the soil. So something to consider. If you're going to put rocks in the bottom of a pot, make sure you're not changing its shape from being a, a, a pretty um, exaggerated cylinder. So just a few rocks down there at the bottom. Don't fill it up. Um, you can actually cause it to hold more water, just like a sponge will hold more water when it's on its side. This is per volume of the same sponge. Compared to if you turn it vertically, it actually drains all that water out, just capillary action. So, um, just something to think about. If you're putting rocks in the bottom of your pots for drainage and you're putting too many rocks in there, you can actually be causing it to hold water and not drain properly. I think the theory is, is the rocks are going to keep the holes from getting clogged, but most of the nursery pots I have have holes on them this big and there ain't no, no soils clogging those things up whatsoever. Okay, so next, uh, coffee grounds. Putting coffee grounds in your soil to change the soil's pH, to lower the soil's pH. Because we all know that coffee is an acid, right? So I'm going to uh, add these acid coffee grounds. So I'm going to add these acidic coffee grounds to my soil to lower the soil's pH. If I have soil uh, pH that's too high, um, I'm going to add this, uh, the, the acidic coffee grounds to lower the soil's pH. Um, this, is, this one's a straight myth um, because after you've made coffee, uh, all the acid's in your cup. So coffee grounds are actually pretty neutral. And the other part of coffee grounds that is a myth is that it adds nitrogen to your soil. And I think one of the reasons why people think, well, first of all, it's a straight myth. Coffee grounds is actually right in the middle. Uh, I wish I had my composting shirt on today. Um, when you're trying to compost, uh, you're going for a 25 to 1. I'm going to talk fast. Uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio. Anything below 20 to 1. Uh, is considered a nitrogen, and anything above about 30 to 1 is considered a carbon, and then anything in the middle there is in the middle, 
Uh, so grass and hay and coffee grounds, um, those are all actually right in the middle. So yes, if you have a pile that is too much on the carbon side, it is going to pull it down toward the nitrogen side. It's a spectrum. Um, and then, but if you also have a pile that's too much on the nitrogen side, it's actually going to pull it up to be more like a carbon. Or if you have a pile that's already in the middle, it's not going to change it at all. So coffee grounds is, although it does contain nitrogen, it is not a nitrogen. Um, but coffee grounds can help a pile of compost heat up as if it was a nitrogen, but that actually has more to do with the shape of the actual coffee grounds and their surface area and the speed at which the composting bacteria can get at those particles um, with, you know, still getting good airflow and all that stuff. But coffee grounds added to your soil, it does add great organic matter. Um, and again, the microbes that are in your soil um, can break it down uh, very quickly. So you might see signs like you added a, a very nitrogen rich uh, fertilizer because the bacteria that actually consume the nitrogens in the coffee grounds into nitrites and feed it to your plants to convert into nitrates. Uh, it's much easier for those organisms to get to the uh, coffee grounds and consume them and feed them to your plants. So your plants will actually see a nitrogen boost uh, much faster, but it's not because the coffee grounds are rich in nitrogen. They're actually right smack there in the middle. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know, that 25 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio is literally, as far as um, atoms per living cell in that thing that is organic, uh, has a carbon to nitrogen ratio that's literally the number of carbon atoms to nitrogen atoms. So everything is actually more carbon rich than nitrogen rich, even like chicken blood, which I think we can all agree is very much agreed on nitrogen is like four to one. So that's still four parts carbon to one part nitrogen. Um, you know, oak leaves can be anywhere from 30 to one to 60 to one. Um, uh, like a Dried two by four, I think, can be like 200 to one. Paper is like a thousand to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. Anyway, so coffee grounds is 25 to one, which is right there in the middle. So it's actually not a nitrogen, it is a neutral. Um, so coffee grounds um, is not the best source of nitrogen, rich source of nitrogen uh, to your uh, garden bed. Um, However, it does add organic matter and it does add some nitrogen and it definitely does not affect the pH of the soil because it's definitely not an acid. All of that acid comes out in your cup of coffee. Um, speaking of, um, changing your soil's pH just in general is a real big pain. Um, if your soil it has a pH that uh, is high or low due to minerals, you're going to want to combat that with minerals. If it is high or low due to organic matter, you want to combat that with organic matter. But if you're within the range, uh, at least you know somewhat in the ballpark of where you need to be, the best thing you can do is to encourage uh, uh, a good soil diverse biome because those bacteria and and um, and fungi that live in the soil in symbiosis so to speak with your plants they all actually have the ability not all of them but there's a good number of them that have the ability to excrete things that make minor adjustments to the soil pH to where the plant uh, is the happiest. So understand that the, the healthier those plants are, the more carbons they're making through photosynthesis and the more carbons they're pushing down into the soil. So the soil biology has a vested interest in the plant that's growing above it being as healthy as possible. And so if that means making minor adjustments to the pH so that that plant can have optimal mineral absorption, then they do it. Um, they actually can excrete things and those make permanent changes to the soil. If you actually look at a, like a bunch of azaleas, say growing underneath an oak tree, um, and they're doing really well and blooming, uh, and they need, they need a real low pH. Um, that's because, uh, azaleas and oak trees actually share, uh, a lot in common with which soil biology they like to, um, 
buddy buddy up with. So uh, they usually um, they do really well under under oak trees. Oak trees have I didn't even have that on my list. I'm gonna add it to my list. While we're talking about it, oak leaves also are not acidic. A lot of people think they are, and they rake them up from underneath their oak trees because they think that the soil underneath an oak tree is more on the acidic side because of the oak leaves falling down. Like they might be ha having trouble growing grass in the soil. Nope, that soil is acidic because the oak tree is growing there. The oak tree is growing there, therefore it's making relationships with certain microbes that have the ability to turn the pH of the soil down, which is where the where the oak tree likes it. Um, and so that's what the microbes do. So underneath the oak tree, where all the roots are, out to the root line, whether you rake the leaves up or not, you're going to have acidic soil, or more more on the acidic side. Next up, eggshells. How many of y'all put eggshells in your garden for calcium for your uh, Tomatoes, usually, is why people put them in there. Um, why is this a garden mess? Okay, so eggshells break down very slowly. Um, I believe if you crush them up, like, with your hands or just, you know, pulverize them or put them in their hole um, and composted them, you're looking at a year, I believe, it was like a year, year and a half, eight months, uh, before that calcium is ever going to feed a plant. Um, so very, very slow process. Uh, putting them in the soil, it takes even longer. So basically like putting whole eggshells or crushing them up with your hands just a little bit, putting them in the soil, that's going to take the longest, maybe a year and a half, two years. If I'm off by these by a couple months, I apologize, but you guys will get the gist of it. Uh, crushing them up really fine and throwing them in your compost pile, they're going to be available to your plants. That calcium is going to uh, get into your plants in, let's say, eight months to a year. Uh, pulverizing them, cooking them in an oven, and then pulverizing them in a, um, in a uh, what was I say, a food processor, um, and then putting a dust in your garden, that'll make them available in, let's say, six months. Uh, pulverizing them, or cooking them in the oven, pulverizing them in the food processor, and then soaking them in vinegar, that's going to make the calcium available to your plants much, much faster. That's definitely the way you want to go um, if you're trying to use eggshells in your garden. So, um, you know, just adding eggshells to your garden uh, because uh, your tomatoes need calcium right now is not doing a damn thing. Um so, you know, best to try and find some other source of calcium. There's one, I haven't looked it up yet, but I see it pop up every once in a while. I keep meaning to look it up, and that's people talk about putting a Tums uh, down in your, uh, down in your box. So, like, calcium is, um, calcium is a weird nutrient in plants. Um, it can get locked up pretty quickly. It can get locked up and bound up in the soil. Um I believe even on our bodies, um, it, it acts really weird. I've heard of, I'm going out on a limb here, guys, because I am not a doctor. I'm just talking from my uh, memory, and I'm, this might uh, uh, spark some things for you guys. But I believe people who take, like, the wrong types of calcium supplements, it can actually cause you to pee out more calcium um, and cause issues with your bone density. Um, calcium is kind of the same in in plants. It's it's not a straight shooter. You, you can't. Um, it doesn't it doesn't work really well going side to side in a plant. So it works best going from bottom up and out. Um, so it's really crappy as a foliar spray because it doesn't spread all around the plant uh, really well. And the, it depends on the type of calcium. Uh, uh, when it's added, what it's added with. So if you have too much of other nutrients, calcium can get locked up either in the soil, in the roots, or in the plant overall. So um, we just add a normal um, uh, light calcium uh, fertilizer. It's in our 566 and our 835 that we sell. And it is a form that is available for the plants. And we just add that in uh, in regular intervals. Uh, we don't have to worry about it. But uh, if you're trying to look for kitchen 
solutions than uh, trying the eggs crushed up, baked, crushed up, pulverized, not crushed, pulverized, and then mixed with vinegar uh, for a period of time. And then you pour that over your plants. You're going to get the calcium that you need right away into your plants much, much faster. The next one, dish soap. Well, I have dish soap. We're going to just say soap. Dish detergent and soap. So we'll talk, I mean, home, home insecticides in general. Um, dish soap, for me, that's a, or dish detergent, that's a big no-no. I won't use that no matter what. Um, it can burn your plants in a heartbeat. Detergent is just way too harsh. If you give a crap, um, technically it's not even allowed under organic uh, production. It has to be a, a mild soap. Um, and even using soaps uh, to take care of certain insects uh, just out of the blue without really trying anything else, um, it can actually be uh, detrimental um, to the plants. It actually, plants have a protective coating on them and they, uh, using soap and using it too often can actually pull the protective coating off of the plants, making them more susceptible to insect attacks. Um, so sometimes I just try mechanical means of getting those insects off my plants. Um, if I am adding soap, I'm usually using some other type of organic pest control at the same time. And it's just to increase effectiveness for it. And it's really a last, uh, last resort uh, measure because I like to wait for the predatory insects to come and show up and help me. Yes, uh, Dr. Bronner's soap is still going to hurt the outside of your plants. It's just, it's not something I would just use just because it's Dr. Bronner's soap, but the, if we use any soap, that's the soap we use. Um, and we use very, we, we, we use spot treatments on the plant and only target the insects that we're trying to get. Um, so for example, we uh, just had a white fly infestation and we actually went out first and went over every single plant and picked off every leaf that had the white fly underneath it uh, and dumped and dropped it in a bottle of soapy water. Um, and then we went back and sprayed the area and the plants with uh, an organic, and we were in a nursery, so we moved all the flowering plants away and then moved all the plants that had the white fly into one area. And we treated them all with an organic pyrethrin um, and we had to do two treatments of that to take care of the white fly. And uh, to do that, we actually used it just a tiny bit of the Dr. Bronner soap. Um, but it really was last uh, last resort. We tried a lot of other stuff. Uh, we put a fan out there. Um, and it's just the problem kept getting worse and worse. Uh, so we decided to step it up. So we always start like way down here and then keep bumping up our uh, pest control methods uh, until it would have it finally works. I mean, the bottom line is on most of these pests, they have a season. Um, they'll, you know, they they kind of peak during a certain time of year and then go down. So sometimes all I do is I get on our compost plus liquid fertilizer and our micros plus liquid fertilizer, and I put them in uh, four ounces to a gallon of compost plus, two ounces per gallon of micros plus, and I feed those to my plants about two to three times a week until the pest problem subsides. And that usually gives the plant enough uh, nutrients and energy to kind of push it through um, and, and take care of the problem, along with mechanical, uh, picking off the pests, picking off the damaged parts of the leaves. I've carried uh, plants through uh, insect pressure and through fungus pressure just by simply uh, putting them on a regimen of the compost plus and the micros plus and mechanical removal and haven't even gotten out any soap or any other type of uh, pesticide. Uh, organic or not. So neem oil. Neem oil. We'll go ahead and cover neem oil um, and diatomaceous earth at the exact same time. Um, and why I have them on my list of garden myths. These all have their place. They all have their place and their time. Diatomaceous earth and neem oil are not some silver bullet that you can get out there and your plants just aren't looking so hot. 
uh, or you see bite marks and just dust the diatomaceous earth all around or spray neem oil everywhere without learning about your plants and learning about the pests. If you want to get into garden, it's a good idea to understand that you're beginning to get into entomology, the study of insects. So there, there's nothing out there or you sh that, sh that you should just be spraying on a regular basis, not Dr. Bronner's soap, not diatomaceous earth, not neem oil, nothing. There's nothing that you just go spray on your plants as an in or add to your plants as an insecticide so you don't have to think about or figure out what's wrong with your plants. It's not how this works um, effectively. It's, it's a good idea to start learning Maybe keep a journal and learning what insects are attacking your plants during what time. Sometimes the damage isn't even uh, uh, bad enough that warrants any type of real pest control intervention. So understanding your plants' thresholds as well. You know, I mean, I don't get out there and start um, worrying about the aphids at the first sign of aphids. I I pay attention. I try and see what my uh, my my plants are looking like I understand my plants thresholds. I increase sometimes uh, a liquid regimen of liquid organic fertilizers because that can actually increase your plants threshold. So let's say if the population of whatever pest that's on your plants is, is climbing, 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 climbing. And right up here at this line, this is a graph, by the way, and right up here at this line on the graph is when the predatory insects finally show up and start taking care of them. But your plant's threshold is down here. And the pest population has grown, 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 grown. Well, if you feed it with liquid nutrients, Scott even said the stronger your plants are, the stronger they'll resist pests. So by feeding it some extra liquid nutrients and minerals, you actually raise that bar up. God, this sounds familiar. So 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 when you when the when the when the when the, uh, when the predatory insects show up and begin to flatten that curve. We've raised the bar up a little bit of your plant's threshold so that they don't die. So sometimes just by raising my plant's threshold through feeding, through having healthy soil, um, and, and making sure they're getting the right amount of sunlight, that increase your plant's threshold, which uh, as the, the insects that are attacking your plants, populations begin to rise, and then the population of predatory insects is right behind it, it'll actually, then the population of the predatory insects begins to grow and flatten that curve for the insects that are damaging your plants, but you never really killed your plants because you did things to raise your plants thresholds. So sick and weak plants have lower thresholds. Um, so getting out there and just spraying your plants with soap all the time, putting your garden in the wrong location, not focusing on your soil, not focusing hard on your feeding regimen, what your plants are eating, uh, your soil biology, all of these things lower your plants thresholds and make them more susceptible to insect attacks. So it, anyway, just that's why I have neem oil on here. That's why I have diatomaceous earth on here. Um, not because they don't work and they don't have their place. They work amazing on certain insects and under certain conditions, but they are not a silver bullet to, they, they are not a replacement to learning about your plants and learning about the insects that we have in this area. Um, do, 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 do. Yep, I went through all the ones that I had written down. Let's see if you guys wrote any in. Okay. I'm scrolling back up to the top here. Okay. All right, we're just gonna do garden myths. Anybody? Nope. Nope. Christine says, well, let's put it up here. Epsom salt vinegar at dawn that mixed with water kills weeds. Does not work. So what are y'all's experience with this one? Does it work? Oh, 
you guys can see each other, can't you, Beth? Because then Beth said it does work, but it takes forever. Maybe she was talking about the slugs. I don't know. Um. So, Christine, I agree. Um, however, I have been using some organic um, weed killer that are vinegar based. Um, I do mix a little bit of uh, soap. I don't use Dawn. That's a detergent. I don't have detergent anywhere near my gardens. Um, but the thing to remember with all of these uh, organic uh, uh, weed control is it's no different than sending your kids out into the garden and having them weed improperly. So if having the kids go out to your garden and weed improperly, whatever weeds that's going to kill, this stuff is going to kill. Whatever, and what, but I, what I mean by weeding improperly, I mean like they go out there and they just rip the top of the plant off and they leave all this big root under the ground for bigger weeds. So uh, anything that my, you know, a, a, a six-year-old will go out there and weed and kill, the, uh, the vinegar works. Anything that is going to grow back uh, because the kids aren't weeding properly um, is going to grow back if you use the vinegar. Same thing with the torch. Um, if you go out there and you start burning your plants with a torch. Um, same thing. I have I have a torch. I have a steamer. Um, I've tried it all, and at the end of the day, uh, I usually just end up pulling the suckers out with my hands. Um, what I have found is when I do use the vinegar, and when it's really effective, is when an area has become extremely overgrown. And uh, and a lot of the weeds have uh, put out seed heads. And I go out there and I, I pull all the weeds, all the stuff that we don't want. You got to imagine we're just dropping weed seeds everywhere. So usually um, I try and get back to that location within a week or two because all the little tiny weeds from all the seeds that I just dropped everywhere in the mulch and in the pathways, all that stuff's going to be sprouting. And the vinegar definitely kills that. So if you can get, you know, a good thorough weeding, pull, hand pull everything out that's that's big, and can bring it into some sort of a regular uh, regimen where you're only spraying the tiny sprouts that just popped up, it totally works. Um, but yeah, it is definitely, um, you know, I, I don't like to use a lot of the vinegar in my garden beds, um, and then definitely uh, Epsom salts. I don't know even why that's. And there are a lot of people who use regular salt, which can really screw up your soil. Um, and then the soap, I just use a little bit of soap. That actually does help it stick to the plants just a little bit. I don't even put enough in there to really, you know, I'm not trying to burn it with the soap. And by the way, we're not using store-bought vinegar. I have 30% vinegar. I'll be putting that on the website here eventually. I'm just doing some more um, trials with it because um, I'm trying to figure out the best way to use it to have it be the most effective um, playing with, you know, how much water to mix with it, if any, how much soap to mix with it. Um, so I'm playing with a couple products to figure out which one I'm going to put up on the website. Um, and when I figure everything out, I will, uh, I'll let you guys know, but we don't, I believe store-bought vinegar is like five to 7%. And so we're playing with 30% vinegar. So even if we mix that 50, 50 with water, we're, we're still at double the strength of what you buy at the grocery store. All right, so let's see. Let's take hers down. All right. Let's see if anyone else. Scott, I am not... Um, very knowledgeable in this area. Um, I have heard what you said. Do not add biochar that has not been inoculated. First big mistake I made. Um, I mean, I've heard, I didn't know it was a mistake. Uh, I just heard it's pretty much useless. If you don't get it, uh, I believe they call it uh, charged. Um, so you said inoculated, but I think we're saying the same thing. Um, so you want to make sure that you get it charged first. And then uh, let's see. Michelle James says, I'm late. Yes, Michelle, you were very, very late. Um, and then let's see. 
anyone else? Scott says thoughts on rock dust. Um, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about um, earlier on soil pH. So rock dust is just what it says it is. It's ground up rocks. Uh, that does not mean automatically that those minerals are going to be available to your plants. So you have to have soil that has the right type of uh, pH and uh, the right type of soil activity to feed those minerals to your plants. Um, the the minerals that we like to add, I think I think it was really good for the long term. If you need stuff for the short term, like the micronutrient that we sell is uh, chelated uh, micronutrients uh, with the, the main ones that your uh, plants need, and they'll definitely get into the plants. Um, I found with some plants, you can definitely overdo it because too much of certain minerals is bad for plants. Um, but the thing to remember is that plants don't particularly like a certain pH. Am I saying that right? Um, they don't. They don't necessarily like a certain soil pH. What it is is certain plants really like certain nutrients and minerals. And if you actually made a graph of say a blueberry plant and which minerals it likes and how much, you know, you get nitrogen density. So you're going to get like a, a a graph that's got how you know, the percent, it likes more of this than this, and it likes more of this one than this one. And then the different plant graphs are going to look, you know, different depending on what your plants are, because uh, obviously different plants have different nutritional needs. Well, if you made a, a graph that basically had a soil pH on one line, and then the minerals on the other, and the rate at which those minerals dissolve in water based on what the pH is, you, you could actually line the graphs up and they would look identical. So in other words, like um, if you took a pH, of, let's say the, the, a known pH for blueberries, blueberries like this certain pH. Like I said, you make one graph that shows which minerals and nutrients the, the blueberries like the most. The ones that the blueberry likes the most just so happen to be the most soluble in water um, that's at the pH that blueberries like. So it's not really the pH that the blueberries like, it's that the blueberries like a certain set of minerals and that happens to be the pH that the, those minerals dissolve the most readily in water. So you can add all the rock dust in the soil you want until you're blue in the face. If your soil pH isn't right spot where it needs to be, your plants aren't gonna absorb the minerals that they need. They'll, they'll, I mean, they're there, but they're not available um, to the plants. There's a couple things that actually help with that. One of them would be having active uh, uh, mycorrhizae uh, fungus in the soil. The mycorrhizae fungus, which its main job is really pulling phosphorus into your plants. The phosphorus is a very excited molecule, and um, and and the the fungal tissue walls of the mycelium or hyphae. Are, are very, very thin, and um, the, uh, things can pass through the walls of the fungi very easily, uh, of the mycorrhizae, uh, uh, mycelium, or hyphae, depending on which mycorrhizae you're talking about. And um, if you didn't know, phosphorus gets bound up in soil very well. It's a very excited, uh, unbalanced, um, the ions of the I think I'm saying this right, of, of the, it's been a while since I looked at this stuff, of the phosphorus is very imbalanced, which makes it extremely excited. So let's call it magnetic. And so phosphorus has a really bad, this is, this calcium does the same thing, has a really bad habit of actually getting bound up in the soil. So it grabs onto stuff very tightly and makes it unusable uh, by certain, uh, makes it unusable by, um, by the plant. Well, if you have, fungus growing in your soil that is living symbiotically with your plants, the fungus actually travel out 
and they find that phosphorus. Well, when they go to pull the phosphorus in through their cell walls to feed it to your plant, um, the phosphorus is so excited. When that phosphorus comes up into the fungi, um, like a straw, to get pulled up to your plant, it actually pulls long chains of these minerals with it in into the mycelium or hyphae and kind of sucks them up into the plant. So it's kind of a secondary method that the fungi actually, um, the fungi actually uh, end up pulling extra minerals into your plant. But they also have the ability um, to excrete um, an excretion into the soil to actually make minor adjustments to that soil pH to make those minerals that are in the soil water soluble so that the plant's roots can actually pull them up as well. And Corey Elko, if you're listening to this, this is why I don't recommend solarizing your beds. I do not think they look into this stuff in the studies that you're looking at, but um, you burn those mycelium right up and they won't grow back in one growing season, maybe for perennials or something. But anyway, um, I could go on and on. I, I didn't bring up solarization today because it's a hot topic. Hold on. Uh, Tammy, this will be my last one. I've been on for a while. Um, Tammy wants to know, is it best to start from seed or by plants? Um, seeds are cheap. Time and space is not. That is my that is my mantra. I might put that on a t-shirt. Seeds are cheap. Time and space is not. What do I mean by that? Um, if you wanted 20 plants in your garden, then take 60 seeds and go out and make 20 holes where the plants are supposed to go and put three seeds in each hole. If they all come up, go out there with scissors and kill the extra ones so that there's one plant per hole. <clears throat> um, in this isn't in very limited circumstances is a good idea to actually dig plants up and try and separate them. I do it. I don't recommend it. Why? Because seeds are cheap and time and space is not. And you don't know it uh, if you're pulling those plants up and you're trying to separate them and you're damaging the roots and you know maybe you think you were successful because you didn't kill it but that doesn't mean now that that plant isn't three weeks behind the rest of them and time is not cheap it's not on our side with gardening those three weeks that's a lot of time that could be three weeks of harvest because if you've gardened here before you know every single season that we're growing in has got a brick wall that we're coming at fast uh, where the season's just in like that. And so that three weeks is three more weeks of harvest before we don't get our, you know, there's like your garden's going to die on the day it's going to die, even if you're doing everything right. So we want to cheat the garden season on the front end to get more garden time because whatever happens on the back end is going to happen when it happens. So what I say, seeds are cheap and time and space is not. If you have the financial resources, um, I would recommend if you're a new gardener um, to try both and do them side by side. Uh, well, actually, try th we got three. You can try three things. You can try buying plants. You can try buying seeds and straight seeding those seeds right into your garden, and then starting some seeds in like little seed trays. Try all three. If you're new to gardening, the faster you start trying all three of these, the faster you're going to learn which ones work for you and which ones don't. The faster you're going to get yourself to a point where you know, okay, every year I'm buying tomato plants, but these, 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 I buy seeds. Um, everybody's a little different. Everybody's soil is a little different. Everybody's situation is a little different. There's certain things I always straight seed. I never uh, do and that's most of the root crops. And I say most of because I will sometimes pre-start turnips 
in like little four packs just to give me a head start and basing the plant out real well. Uh, actually, I, I mean, a lot of the root crops that kind of grow on top of the soil, uh, they do what beets uh, and turnips, uh, rutabagas, I do okay with those as starts. Carrots, um, onions actually do pretty good too, um, uh, starting from seed in uh, like a separate container and transplanting them out. You know, carrots are a big no-no, um, always straight seed your carrots. Um, also, anything that's got really big seeds um, that germinate quickly, like beans, you know, give it a shot. Buy the seeds, throw them out there. If you screw it up, you're only talking about three days to a week, um, and then you can buy the plants if it didn't work out. But if you if you if you can mix it up uh, and and try uh, as many different uh, different scenarios with seeds and plants as you can, because definitely. If, if you can figure out which things you like to buy seeds for, it's way cheaper. You can um, usually get your garden going when you want to get your garden going. And you have many, 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 many varieties at your fingertips. Um, I mean, even myself, we only carry six kinds of kale, which is a lot compared to most nurseries. And that's not even scratching the surface of what's out there. Um, so... You, it, by buying plants, you're limited to variety. Um, and when you get into seeds, kind of things just kind of go wide open. And also, if you get into planting seeds, it's it's a whole other thing, but you might learn how to start saving seeds of the stuff that you're already growing um, for the next year's crop. And we are going, I was trying to make these things uh, 30 minutes, and now we're going over an hour. Uh, but Next week, guys, I have um, a really fun guest. I hope you guys can join me. Um, for people who are just tuning in, um, other than today, which is on Thursday, this is uh, going to be live every Wednesday at 5.30 on uh, the Whitwell Organics Facebook page, or you can find it on your on our YouTube. We do have a YouTube channel. Um, there will be, be eventually some content that will be going out strictly on the YouTube channel. So I do invite you guys to go over there and check it out. There really isn't anything up on it uh, at the moment, except for some old videos I was screwing around with a long time ago. If you want to see chickens being, uh, chickens hatching, you know, those those are on there. If you want to see my daughters being crazy in the gardens, uh, that's also on there. Um, other than that, it's just these videos, but eventually there will be some unique content coming to the YouTube channel. So make sure that you like our YouTube and subscribe as well. And then if you cannot join us on Wednesdays and you would like to participate with a garden question uh, or need gardening advice, or if you have a topic, or if you would like to be on the show, you can contact me at info, I-N-F-O, at witwomorganics.com. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night.